Okay, we'll go ahead and call the September meeting to order. 603. Uh, okay, and we'll go ahead and start with the uh, City and County of Honolulu monthly reports. Uh, Honolulu Fire Department. Hello. Uh, firefighter Thomas Hom with Engine 3 uh, Third Watch. Uh, as far as the information previously requested at the August 15, 24 meeting, following questions were asked. Safety concerns regarding the former Makiki Library building where the where this NHB um, neighborhood board meeting meets. Uh, Captain Moore said he would inform the HFD's um, FPB and uh, he has sent an email to Captain Kendall Ching. Okay, um, questions about fires in the Liho Liho area involving homeless squatters. Captain Moore encouraged them to contact the HF, HFD's FPB for fire safety advice and tips. And uh, third question, which areas in the Makiki neighborhood are prone to brush fires? Tantless and round top areas typically have the most brush fire calls. But they are also very green, which helps to reduce limit the fire spread in those areas. Okay, we're going over the incident statistics for August 2024. As far as fires go, structure fires, we've had four. Uh, wildland and brush fires, uh, none accounted for. Nuisance fires, six. Cooking fires, one. And activated, activated alarms with no fires, 14. Okay, as far as emergencies go, uh, medical calls, 138. Motor vehicle collisions with pedestrians, zero. Motor vehicle crash collisions, 11. Mountain rescues, one. No ocean rescues and no hazardous materials incidents. And then going over the fire safety tips and announcements. Uh, fire safety tip, uh, move over for emergency vehicles. Drive with caution and obey all traffic laws, including the move over law to help protect our 1st responders while performing their duties near or on a roadway. Um, this is more of a more than a public courtesy. It's the law. Hawaii revised statutes 291 C-27 requires a driver of a vehicle that is approaching an emergency vehicle that is stopped for an emergency investigation of a possible traffic violation, rendering assistance to a police officer or other official duties as indicated by the flashing emergency lights of the stopped emergency vehicle shall, one, slow down to a reasonable and prudent speed that is safe under the circumstances of an emergency road situation ahead. If necessary, the driver shall come to a complete stop before making a lane change under paragraph two. Two, uh, make a lane change into the adjacent lane if necessary and if it is safe to do so, or if possible to two lanes over, which leaves one lane between the driver and the emergency vehicle. Note, uh, emergency vehicle means police, fire, EMS, ocean safety, freeway service patrol, tow trucks, and even some state and county vehicles while personnel are working. Okay, and do you have any questions for the Honolulu Fire Department? Okay, we'll start with questions from the board, Richard. Hi, hello. This is about the, uh, I think the first item you brought up about the latches on the stairway on the first floor. Anyway, that that's besides the elevator. That's the only exit from the upper floors to get outside. If there was a fire and emergency. And if that door has been locked and, and there's just a slide lock there. There's also a latch to put another lock on there. So my understanding those that door cannot be be able to be secured from the outside. There's a fire, the elevator's not working. We had got to, we go down that fire escape and it's locked from the outside. We're trapped in here. We brought this up two months ago and it still hasn't been resolved. So is my understanding correct that, that those locks on that door are illegal or against code? Hi, sorry, I'm the captain. Um, 
as far as code goes, so what Captain Moore said is that he forwarded that email to Fire Prevention Bureau, that's the FPB. I cannot say whether or not what's legal and what's not legal anymore. I know that cane bolts and things like that are illegal for schools and auditoriums. Um, as far as what's on there, I haven't I have to go down and look. Um, but supposed to be a Fire Prevention Bureau is reaching out to Department of Parks Rec, who probably owns this. And um, any kind of remediation is going to have to go through them. Unfortunately, the law doesn't give us the teeth to go just remove stuff. We just have to kind of kick the property owner. And so I think that that is probably the path. I can follow up with Kendall Chang and see where we're at as far as that goes. But if you're right, emergency exits, especially when the building is in use, are not supposed to be able to be secured from the outside. All right, thank you. That's my understanding. Are there any questions? Any other questions? Okay, seeing none from the board, uh, open it up to the uh, guests. Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we do have to return to the station, so we won't be able to stay. So sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Honolulu Police Department. Uh, good evening, Chair, and everyone in attendance. Lieutenant Arnold Sabusi representing the Honolulu Police Department, District 1 Community Area Responsibility. Uh, thank you guys for your time and patience. I apologize for uh, last weekend's or oh, last uh, meeting's um, miss of myself being uh, in attendance. Uh, but there was something that came up uh, last minute. Uh, so I'm going to get straight into the uh, the stats for this month of August 2024. I know you guys have a very full agenda. So motor vehicle tests uh, for the month of August were 15. It's down from the previous month to, uh, of 20. Uh, burglaries is actually really good. We're down to three. In the previous month, it was 12. Uh, thefts are also down 24. Previous month was 38. Uh, UMVs are slightly up. Um, by a 33%, 21 from the previous month, it was 14. Assaults were nine, previous month was seven. Uh, six assaults were one, previous month was two. Uh, there were no graffiti cases reported for both months. Uh, and drug related offenses were three for August and previous month of five. Uh, total cost for service for your particular area was 2,104. Previous month is 2,333. So it's slightly down from the previous month, but at this point in time, there's no criminal breaches to report at this time. Uh, uh, District 1 participated in a books and badges event at Walmart Kiyomoku uh, the first weekend of September. Uh, and they re we raised uh, 16, over $16,000 uh, for Special Olympics in, in the three days that we were there. I just wanted to extend uh, great thanks and gratitude to the public, that uh, especially those who had uh, participated and uh, donated to this great cause. Uh, upcoming events uh, that might affect the district uh, will be the Aloha Parade Festival that will be happening on September 28th. The parade will be getting set up uh, early that morning at about 6 a.m., and starting from Alamona Beach Park, going to Waikiki and ending at Kapilani Park. Uh, expect uh, road and lane closures and in the surrounding areas and leave early uh, if you need to get somewhere that day. Uh, safety tip for the month of September is regarding securing vehicle loads. Uh, we at HPD have been responding uh, to a lot of calls for debris on the roadways and freeways, uh, some of which are happening on H1 freeway. Uh, it is due to not securing our belongings effectively. Uh, we found all kinds of things on the freeway, especially uh, like uh, construction hard hats, coolers, cooler lids, uh, plastic chairs, play pens, surfboards, and even Christmas trees at times. Uh, these items become extremely hazardous to motorists, especially motorcyclists. Uh, we're asking our community members to take more time and be patient to securing loose items in the bed of your truck or even on your roof racks. Uh, most uh, motor vehicle fatalities uh, to present uh, uh, present day uh, in 2024 is at 28 this year uh, compared to the same time last year is 30. So we want to keep that downtrend. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to yield back the rest of my time so I can take questions from the board members and public activities. Thank you very much. Uh, I see you already have a question <laughs> from the board. Uh, go ahead, Claire. Aloha. Thank you again, Lieutenant Segusio. Um, the five way intersection prospect Ilani Alapai, where we several months ago put a five way stop sign. The situation of running stop signs is getting worse and worse. And I'm hearing that from more and more community members and almost got creamed a few times myself. So could we ask for more police presence or monitoring in that area? 
Absolutely. So um, from the last meeting that I attended, I, I know that was part of the subject. I actually went and um, viewed the location myself. Uh, there was some instances we did some traffic stops over there. Um, no citations were issued at that point in time. Uh, there, there were more generally just rolling stops. Uh, but yes, I can see the issue because if it's being a five way and the level change, uh, the curvature of the hill. Uh, but yes, I will take that to my patrol units and have more patrols done over there and see if we can get some citations for some red, uh, some stop like stop sign violations. Thank you, Lieutenant. I know it's difficult because there's no hiding place there for a police vehicle. So <laughs> you're kind of exposed. Anyone seeing you can suddenly slow down, but really we need help before somebody gets hurt again. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, next up, Chuck. Yeah, Lieutenant Sagusio, I wanted to commend you and uh, Major Okimoro and your team for your efforts in addressing the um, homeless in our community. Notice a um, big improvement. Um, I know it's an ongoing project, but I see a lot of improvement, especially in that corridor by um, the Picoy Lunalilo. You know, they've been pretty much cleared out of that area. I know they're going across the street or whatever, and some of them might drift back, but overall, good um, progress. And thank you again. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Um, I'll, I'll pass that on to uh, Major Okimoto. Yes, he started this initiative, um, I think, about a month and a half ago in regards to addressing all of the RCP issues, the residentially challenged people issues in, in uh, all areas of District 1. Um, so we, we've been we've been um, monitoring this P Koi Luna Lilo, and uh, we just asked the public to be a little bit patient. Obviously, uh, the analogy was used. Um, it's that last fork in the sink that's not clean. Uh, it, it, it always pops up from time to time, uh, but majority of the dishes are, are, are very clean. But we just wanted to um, address those uh, outliers uh, that um, kind of congregate in the area. But give us some time, and then we'll, we'll, we'll definitely um, make some headway. Next up, uh, Harris. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Sagusio, and as well as uh, Major Komoro. Um, you know, now that uh, as part of the Nice Neighborhoods campaign, and there's a lot more activity in terms of the standard when you talk about that last fork in the sink, the the residents in the area become, as they start to feel that they can uh, take back the community, so their eyes are opening up to look at some of the abandoned cars and so forth. So we really appreciate you guys, uh, the your officers and yourself to take the time to look at these vehicles that are uh, shouldn't be on the road and actually getting them uh, towed away and taken away. So I really appreciate that ongoing effort. Thank you. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Harris. Um, in regards to abandoned vehicles, it's uh, always an issue in the uh, Makiki area, uh, obviously, because due to the on street tight, very tight on street parking. Um, so just realize this. I just wanted to pass this on to the community members. Uh, vehicles can be towed for expired safety and tax. Uh, so it behooves our community members to keep their uh, registration and their tax updated all the time uh, due to the fact that if a complaint comes in and then if it uh, warrants a toll, um, we can tow those vehicles. Yeah. Okay, uh, seeing no more questions from the board, I'll open up to the audience. Seeing none, thank you very much, Lieutenant. You guys have, you guys have a great night. Take care. Um, next up, we have Board of Water Supply, Michelle Harmon. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Michelle Harmon, and I have the Board of Water Supply report for you tonight. Um, so we have no main breaks to report. For our general report, we invite everyone to come to Imagine a Day Without Water on Saturday, September 28th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Kapolei Regional Park. Um, we have zero escape activities, rain barrel workshops, native spe species stickers. Um, we'll be making native seed balls and much, much more. So the event's free for the public and um, there will be shave ice, plate lunches, and vifala available for purchase. So tonight we have three questions to respond to from last month. I'll answer there are two of those, and then our information officer, Kathleen Elliott Pahinui, will be giving our response for the last um, question. Okay, so um, the first question were, was Are there any reports um, of projects to upgrade the punch bowl system, and how old is the area's infrastructure? 
Um, this was asked by a homeowner on Prospect Street. So uh, we have three projects in the design phase. Thomas Square, uh, there is a 20 inch water main relocation. Kalakawa Avenue has a 16 inch um, main project going on from Baratania Street to Alawai Canal. Uh, the water system improvements at various locations are going on around in around Manoa Valley. Uh, so that's our response for the first question. Uh, oh, and we have other projects under construction. So the um, Kalawahine 24 inch main pipeline project is currently under construction. It's scheduled to be completed by the end of 2024, barring any unforeseen circumstances. Okay, so on to the next question. Um, we had an off camera question asking if we had reviewed the plans for 1617 Alapai Street and um, do we have any water concerns for that project? So, um, yes, on May 9th, 2024, the Board of Water Supply reviewed and responded to new plans for an affordable housing development at 1617 Alapai Street. In our response, we indicated that the existing water system is adequate to service this, service this new development. To mitigate the impact of the development on our water system, we are asking for a 10% voluntary water usage reduction in response to the Navy's Red Hill fuel leak, which led to the closure of three vital border water supply water resources. This voluntary request will remain in effect until new water sources are completed. On-site conservation measures are required, such as the utilization of non-potable water for irrigation using a rain catchment system, um, native xeriscaping, including planting drought tolerant plants using a drip system and having water moisture sensors, and the installation of water sense labeled water fixtures and toilets. Um, so that's the response for two questions from last month. And um, now I'd like to introduce our information officer, Kathleen Elliott Pahinui to respond for the last question. Mahalo. Mahalo, Michelle. I'll really quickly uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the infrastructure question, how old the infrastructure is in your community, it varies. Um, yours is an older community, so we have infrastructure going back uh, probably to the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then, of course, a lot of newer stuff, too. But um, it's all in pretty good shape uh, for the most part, and we do have a plan uh, that has uh, rated and ranked all of our infrastructure. So we know what's critical and, and uh, what needs to be replaced immediately and what doesn't. Uh, regarding the question uh, from board member Kareen Carson, how does the detection of PAH at IAL well affect Makiki now into the future? The short answer, it does not. IAL wells only serves the IAEA community. It does not serve the community outside of IAEA. And that's the short answer. Uh, we uh, that, and that well has been turned off since November. Or, I'm sorry, December of 2021, and we do not have any plans at this time to turn it back on. We are currently in the process of looking at two new exploratory wells for that for both the IAEA and Halaba community specifically. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Michelle and Kathleen. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Seeing none, do we have any questions from attendees? Seeing none, thank you very much. And I am to understand, hopefully next month, you guys will have a report. No, no, I believe, uh, sorry, for November, you guys have a, um, a report regarding, I believe, uh, comprehensive upgrades or something to uh, it's our master plan for the uh, uh, primary urban corridor, and yet our um, consultant just needed some more time to finalize a few things. So, yes, keeping our fingers crossed, Chair, that we will have it ready for you, but we will stay in touch with you. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Awesome. Thank you very much. Have a good one, guys. Aloha. Thank you. Okay, next up we have, moving on to board business, uh, we have approval of regular meeting minutes. And we have several corrections submitted by uh, Senator Carol Fukunaga, as well as uh, corrections by Tom Heinrich for Della Blatty's office. Um, the correction. Okay. Um, so uh, Senator Carol Fukunaga is uh, requesting that uh, for the, please correct the section entitled Senator Carol Fukunaga. 
Senate District 11 uh, to read as follows. No representative was present. A copy of Senator Fukunaga's August report to Neighborhood Board 10 was circulated to all board members by email and requested to be filed in the NB10 Google Drive. Uh, so that's the correction requested by Fukunaga. And then the one requested by Tom Heinrich. Uh, let's see here. There's a number of things here. Um, basically going through her section, Tom Heinrich thanked everyone for her re-election. She will continue to serve uh, the addition of continue uh, between will and serve. And then uh, House District 26 for the term of, uh, instead of from uh, Tuesday, November 5th, 2024 to Tuesday, uh, correcting originally it says Sunday to Tuesday, uh, November 8th. And then later on, a community meeting will be held on Tuesday, September 24th, 2024 uh, at Stevenson Middle School Cafeteria, uh, edition of that to discuss little fire ants in the public area. Um, so those are the requested corrections. Uh, are there any other corrections? Okay. And is there, is there a motion to approve the? Chair. Second. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. sorry. That's fine. Um, this would be moving to amend the minutes. Um, as suggested, sorry, those yes, corrections. Sorry. Okay, uh, I guess first, uh, move to <laughs> move to amend the uh, corrections. Okay, uh, is there any? Yeah. Uh, are there any uh, abstentions or dissents? Seeing none, uh, the amendments pass. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, now, uh, are there any uh, abstentions or dissents for the amended minutes? Seeing none, we have our minutes. Chair, I'm sorry, I had my uh, hand up for a while there. Oh, I'm sorry, Ian. Uh, I was just going to offer some amendments. Are we still on this agenda item? Can I just speak them into the record? I don't want to necessarily make another vote. Sure. Okay, um, for the 1525 Liho Liho Street address, one of the additional matters we discussed was the need to try to find free or affordable legal counsel. And I think that's a useful thing to include on the minutes because one of the things we're trying to do in addition to a contacting the property owner is to make sure we have attorneys who will draft a document from the, the property owner to give neighbors permission to call uh, trespassing. And I think it's important that that specific concern uh, is acknowledged. And I'll, I'll mention again uh, under the item when it comes up again this month. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, Claire. Chair, could we at this time take a poll of how many of our guests are here regarding the 1617 Alapai project? I will not entertain that. Um, I believe we should be able to s slam through. <laughs> Chair, at this time, I'd like to make a motion to move okay. item I up to B, where we revisit and vote on the resolution to oppose the affordable housing project at 1617 Alapai Street. A second. Okay. okay. And discussion? Yeah. Yeah. Chuck? I, I totally agree we should move it up. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't resolve this at the last meeting and we have a good showing tonight again, and I'm sure they have a lot of things that they wanna say. So I think it behooves us to move them up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, I believe we can take it to. Yeah, and then uh, are there any objections or abstentions? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and take up a uh, discussion on. So sorry. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Uh, this is one of those rules where to amend the agenda during this meeting, you need uh, two thirds votes of the board seats. That's a number 12. 
If I'm not mistaken, we have 11 tonight. I'm sorry. Those are the rules. At the end of the day, this is your board's call. This is just the advice of the neighborhood commission office. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Tom Heinrich speaking in my individual capacity. Uh, my understanding is this is not in uh, addition to the agenda. It is up to the chair or the board uh, to uh, adjust the agenda as they see fit. Uh, so the advice given from Dylan Buck, I think at this point is, is not relevant to the motion at hand to simply take it out of order. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and <laughs> uh, take the unanimous uh, consent and we'll just go ahead and uh, do as the motion passed. We'll uh, take up the proposed affordable housing building at 1617 Olive by Street. Thank you, Chair. Yep, and we'll go ahead and start with uh, Claire. Thank you again, Chair. In July and August, we had before us at this board, I, I presented about a proposed development at 1617 Alapai Street that violates Punchbowl Special District guidance and also the land use ordinance. I gave you a PowerPoint, et cetera, at that time. Last month in August, multiple community members also came to this meeting and presented their views on why this project should be adjusted and I, I'm going to reiterate we are not asking to stop construction of an affordable housing project we are asking that it be modified to suit punch bowl special district guidance to suit land use ordinance to suit the neighborhood um, that would mean taking it down to a 40 foot height measured from prospect street not the 68 or 80 foot thing he's that developer Paul Lamb is trying to build um, Mr. Lamb has been invited to attend the, these neighborhood board meetings. He's been invited to attend our condominium board meeting. I've asked to meet with him myself. He has declined, 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 uh, or not RSVP'd at all. Um, I'm for myself past the point of asking his opinion or letting him talk. Now we have a community committee group who will be presenting tonight. They have done a extensive amount of research and talked with experts in their fields regarding uh, problems with a, a lot of levels of this design. So I would like to give the floor now to the community to do their presentations. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have someone from the... Okay, go ahead and if you could speak your name. Uh, my name is Ann Smoke. I'm a homeowner uh, across the street from where this project is being proposed. And I like my neighborhood. I care for the neighbors, the ones I know now, the ones that have moved away that I've gotten to know, and the ones who will be moving into the neighborhood and who will probably care for it as much as I do. That's why I'm sharing my concerns for the 1617 development project. At the time of purchase, there were and still are four small single family structures situated on two adjacent lots near and at the corner of Alapai and Prospect Street, all four of which have been and are still used for rental housing. On March 11th, 2022, prior to the closing of purchase, Paul Lamb's architect submitted a sewer connection application for the addition of 29 new sewer connections in addition to one existing one based upon a proposed 30 one bedroom unit Bill 7 rental housing project. The application appears to have resulted in a letter determining sufficient adequacy. On August 15th, 2023, the developer submitted an application for a CUP seeking approval for a joint development of the two adjacent lots I just mentioned to maximize affordable renting units under Bill 7. And that application was based upon a proposed six story 53 one bedroom unit project with eight open air stalls since reduced to four parking stalls. I wonder what plan was submitted for the water department to review. The Honolulu Department of Planning and Permitting Land Use Ordinance states that an applicant seeking to join adjacent lots as a single zoning lot for purposes of joint development must comply with the DPT, DPP's development standards, which may not be modified. The land use ordinance further provides that the director of DPP, where applicable, consider traffic flow and control, access to and circulation within the property, off-street parking, sewerage, drainage, refuse and service areas, utilities, screening and buffering, setbacks, open spaces, lot dimensions, height, bulk location, structures, noise, light, dust, odor, and more. In order to do this, the director of DPP would need to review it an actual plan. 
one submitted with the CUP application as uh, that one that would be submitted with the CUP application as mandated in the DPP's land use ordinance. It says that an application for a CUP will not be accepted unless accompanied by a plan drawn to scale showing the actual dimensions and shape of the lot, the sizes and locations on, of the, on the lot of the existing proposed structures, and if any, and existing and proposed uses of the structure and plan areas. It does not appear that such a plan has ever been submitted for the 1617 Alapai project. As in fact, we double checked today and it is entirely void of any such plan being submitted, okay? So the land use ordinance strongly militates against approval of this project on its own accord that's thought to be constructed along a short dead end street that already services a two building condominium structure and separate apartment building where there is no available on street parking to accommodate the occupants of the 53 new units. There's no public transportation available along the street or the cross streets or even four block, for a few blocks down the steep slope of Ward Avenue. The placement of a six story structure on this planned footprint with limited setbacks will unreasonably compromise the safe distance of fire separation between surrounding structures and the addition of 53 units will greatly increase the density along the short access road and unduly stress an already overburdened infrastructure. You have the pictures to see for yourself. I Come apologize visit. for the quick interruption. Application was if you don't mind summarizing your remarks. Yes, I'm summarizing right now. The DPP on October 23rd, without comment from any third party and without any evidence that the factors re referenced to in the land use ordinance were actually investigated, much less considered. In fact, the process by which the CUP was reviewed and approved appears to have been perfunctory without substance or consideration of the pr protective best practices set forth in the DUP's own land use ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other board members who would like to speak? Okay, well, seeing none, we'll go ahead and. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I did. I did mean board members starting with board members 1st, but seeing none go, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just checking. Yes. Get your mic louder. I said. I'll try talking closer to the microphone. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hello. My name is Janice Lee, and I'm a unit owner and resident of Kahale Moy, the property next to this proposed property. So I've been in this community for 15 years. I'm also a licensed architect in the state of Hawaii. My work primarily focuses on multifamily residential projects, spanning both affordable and market rate housing. Also, having grown up in an affordable housing project myself, I have a deep appreciation for safe, secure, and affordable living environments. When I learned about the proposed 53-unit residential project next door, I felt a mix of curiosity and concern. This site is located at a very challenging and hazardous five way intersection with a blind spot that complicates traffic and turning. At the moment, our neighborhood lacks bus routes and bike lanes, so which means residents will predominantly rely on walking or driving. The introduction of 53 new units will no doubt increase both pedestrian and vehicular traffic, heightening safety risk for everyone in the area. Moreover, I'm particularly troubled by the implication of fire safety. According to the NFPA, one fire code currently adopted by the city and county of Honolulu, this new project will require fire truck access via Alapai Street because Prospect Street is too far away. However, Alapai is already too narrow to accommodate fire trucks safely. This will not only jeopardize emergency access for the new development, but also for the existing residential buildings in that section of Alapai which will rely on it for their daily and emergency access. I've also reviewed the building permit drawings for this project and noticed several key life safety and accessibility design issues that raise concerns. I understand the project is still under review by the DPP and the building code review has not yet been completed. I plan to share my concern about these problematic areas with the DPP and will closely monitor their review comments to see how those comments will be addressed by this project. 
So in closing, while I recognize the community's urgent need for affordable housing, and I support it wholeheartedly, I cannot advocate for developments that are ill-suited for our neighborhood, safety, and infrastructure. I have no issue with affordable housing being built next door. However, the scale and design of this proposed project raise significant concerns regarding its appropriateness for the site and community. So I urge this neighborhood board to consider the potential impact of this project carefully. Please support the resolution to oppose that project. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. So we have had several folks speak uh, against the project. Do we have anyone speaking for? Seeing none. Yes. Richard. I'm reading number 37 that uh, our board opposed the approval of this project. I thought it was to not shut it down, but to make changes. And that at a smaller density, lower heights and all your, you know, with the concerns you folks have. But 37 just says you're asking us to just oppose the approval. Can somebody explain this to me? I guess I'll recognize uh, or Claire, do you have a response? Michelle Luke, you are the composer of the document. Resolution seeks opposition to the project as it is currently constituted in the absence of public comment and in the absence of these concerns being addressed. Still quest? Well, since the contractor has not seen to taken account community concerns at all and is not here again i suggest we, we request that we oppose the project and then come back with the contractor's revisions and then we can do something that's worthwhile we can keep saying nobody in this room is for this one so why do we spend too much more time on this until the contra contractor wants to respond to us Okay, um, well, okay, so I believe there's, or Claire, did you have a motion to adopt a resolution? Uh, we have an original resolution from last month that had the 732 vote. The community here has drafted a 38 item resolution to basically give this board more information to clear up any blank spots. There are a lot of questionable areas in this project design. Um, and that is for this board to support the neighborhood and say, as proposed, we are opposed to this project. And th that is essentially what we want from, from the neighborhood board. We're opposed to this project as proposed. Sorry, might I see the revised or the current version of the resolution? I don't believe I received that. Chair, it's in the uh, drive. Oh, it's in the it's in the drive. Okay. Chuck. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the resolution also is to promote effective community input on affordable rental housing projects. I think that's another aspect of this resolution right. is the input. So, yes, so I would like to entertain a motion to adopt the resolution. Second. Or if, if, if you, yeah, okay. Sure. You can be the military. Yeah, you <laughs> make the move. <laughs> I'm making the move. Bureaucratic stuff. Okay, we're talking about the 39 item yes motion yes. to adopt the 39 opposition 39 item opposition to the bill 7 affordable rental at 1617 alapai as currently proposed yes so as the the maker of the motion go ahead <laughs> if you have anything else to add to the discussion 
If the board has any other questions about it, because I've presented in July and the community has presented in August, we've presented again tonight. There are many, many issues, regulatory issues included on this project that are being skirted and bypassed. Reviews are not being done. Approvals are not being done. It is a, a, a mistake to build a structure of that nature in that location there again. Let's see, I sent a letter out. I sent a letter out to you folks. There are you know, no sidewalks there. There is a 16 foot wide street, which is a fire and emergency vehicle egress. And I've seen fire tried to get through there and they're reversing backwards and going crazy. It's a dangerous situation now to add a, a 53 unit tower with four parking stalls. This is just creating an, a safety issue and a mess. So just straight up motion to Oppose the bill 7 affordable rent uh, rental building at 1617 Alapai street. A 2nd. Yeah. <laughs> it's already, it's already 2nd. Don't worry. Um, okay. So we had 1 in favor. Do we have anyone to speak against the resolution? Okay, Ian, go ahead. Uh, chair, can I speak, uh, in, um. Abstention, like, I actually have some questions. I'm, I'm not actually in a position where I want to speak against. Okay, I'm not sure if this it. is in order. So I want to commend the authors as someone who's written resolutions and bills before uh, 38 specifically citing uh, building ordinances is pretty helpful. And so while my camera's been off, I've been trying to like double check which ordinances are referenced. And I think it's a, a pretty impressive list that was put together here. Uh, in terms of uh, reviews, you know, I want to note my uh, prior concern that, you know, this is something that's up to like D uh, DPP. There's certain threshold standards for what can be approved and what can't. And, you know, there, this doesn't specifically cite any standard by which DPP can oppose. Uh, but if this is a statement of, you know, where the board stands, you know, as opposed to actually calling for any government action to stop the project. It does seem to not immediately raise any red flags like I was concerned about on the last version. Um, as I was reading this over, I got somewhat curious about how Bill 7 plays on this. So, of course, Bill 7 uh, changes and overrules certain uh, ones of the uh, certain ordinances here. And I was wondering if the drafter of the bill could highlight which ordinances or what specific parts. Uh, bill 7 specifically as a bill 7 project uh, interacted with uh, and uh, or if bill 7 doesn't do anything about those ordinances. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Claire, if you'd like to respond. Thank you, Ian. Um, this is entirely a bill 7 project. There's nothing to ferret out one way or another or discuss this. The only thing that changes in the special district guidelines for punch bowl under bill 7 is the height limit. Okay, there are many other guidances in that. In those guidelines that are not being adhered to, and those those are not changed by bill 7. So if you read through the special special district guidelines, and then look at the building plans, you will see the violations. Um, but this was brought in under bill seven so that they could kind of slide in and beat the height limit. And, and we're trying to say at the outset. Who had the authority to carve off a piece of a national monument and landmark and make it part of an urban core. So we still have a deeper dive to go through to get this straightened out. But for now, Ms. Paul Lamb has filed this under bill seven. So the umbrella of the project is bill seven. Uh, okay. Could I uh, could I ask a very brief follow up, sir? Okay, yeah, go ahead, Ian. So that is to say that the ordinances that are cited in this resolution um, have nothing to do with Bill Seven. Is that correct? Did you hear the chorus of no's? No, I didn't hear any of that. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Speak to the question of the board member. Just okay, now. Uh, Ian, I believe there's a community member who is attempting to answer your questions. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Thank Go you. Ahead. My name is Michelle Lucamal, also resident at Kahale Moy. 
Um, Bill 7 was passed. It was supposed to be an interim measure. It was just extended earlier this year all the way through June of 2030. Um, and it is supposed to be an interim measure um, of note. Both bill 7 when, when it was passed by the city council and also supported generally by uh, governor Josh Green's various proclamations, the original one on housing and then. Eight that followed regarding affordable housing make clear in, in particular, the proclamations make clear that in pursuing affordable housing, which is a goal of our community generally. That what should be considered is the maintenance of health and safety, best practices, cultural concerns and other community interests that was in the governor's proclamations. Now, the governor originally had in his proclamation, the bill. Um, beyond barriers work group to further that effort and for other reasons dismantle that group. The city council of note um, also has language in all of its affordable uh, bills and ordinances that makes clear that you are supposed to be balancing these interests. It, it is, this is not a build as a matter of right type of legislation, although that is what is happening. And so, if you look at the most recent resolution by the city council speaking to this issue, it's 24 65 adopted March 15 of this year. And this is where the city council is opposing Could you repeat that number. I'm so sorry. Could you just repeat that number sure. one more time? I'm sorry. It's 24 65. And it was adopted March 15 of this year. And so what is interesting is, and this has to do with the most recent directive um, by the governor that within two years, all of the counties will amend their rules, et cetera, to allow for additional structures on, residen on residential units. And in that um, council resolution, and this had to do um, in part with monster homes. And I would suggest that what it, what the 617 project is, is a monster home on steroids. So the city council adopted this resolution um, stating that the import of balancing, quote, the desire of existing residents to maintain the quiet enjoyment of their residential neighborhoods and of homeowners to protect the significant investment in their homes while pro Close quote, while promoting the development of affordable housing to consider the negative effects projects have on the quote character of neighborhoods and on the availability of on street parking and their heavy impact on public sewer, water, and other infrastructure, close quote, and to give quote ample opportunity to community engagement and input, close quote. So the point being is that these affordable bills. Uh, the ordinances and the proclamations and other government um, missives that we've heard on affor affordable housing, although very well intentioned, were meant to balance interests. This is not a matter of affordable housing versus everybody else. Affordable housing is a need in our community, and we understand that, but it has to be done responsibly, and it has to consider input of the community. There is no mechanism right now in place that allows for this. Absolutely no mechanism. DPP is the only agency or department that is charged with reviewing these permits and they are not considering community interests, even though the mandate underlying bill 7 and all of its surrounding legislation. Inherently requires community input. And so that's why we're here. And, and this neighborhood board, um, their directive as a neighborhood board is to facilitate effective citizen participation in the decisions of government through the establishment of policy providing oversight and evaluation, as well as facilitating the efficient organization and operation of the neighborhood board system. So the very purpose of if this board- If I could board, ask that you summarize your remarks. Sure, okay. I, I'm answering his question. The very purpose of this board is to facilitate that engagement. And overwhelmingly, this has not occurred with the 617 project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, that was effectively a response and a very 
uh, speech in favor, very much in favor of the resolution. Uh, do we have any further opposition to the resolution? I have a question about the resolution. I'm sorry. A question about the resolution. Yes, go for it, Corinne. Okay, and um, if she could break the drafter, if she could just briefly answer. Uh, did she or anyone else involved in this seek legal advice as to the interpretation of these various ordinances um, and so forth mentioned in the resolution? I am an attorney and I uh, do construction litigation. I have done that for probably about 20 years now. I'm very familiar with DPP uh, and the legislative process. Um, as you know, we've also uh, consulted with other individuals uh, in various um, areas, including architects, which would speak to the specific building code and zoning code issues. So we have consulted with, with others as well, and we've tried to be as true to the, the facts objectively as possible in the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I would like to note for the record that I've walked in this area uh, a lot lately, um, ever since, I'm, and it, I just don't think the comment, some of the comments in the resolution are fully accurate, but I probably will be um, voting for it regardless. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is a bus, there, there is nearby bus service. I just, um, at, no, there is, um, not, yeah, not it's, it's right there on board. It's like three blocks away. That's not fly in the rain in the dark. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. But any, but that's that's all that's all I'll say, and I'll I'll. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, Corinne. Okay. Um. We'll go ahead, and I'm seeing as there's virtually no other uh or there's no one to speak in opposition. I believe. Oh. No, Ian. Is your hand still? I just up? wanted to say, regardless of which way the vote went, uh, if there are actual ordinances that are not being followed, I would recommend this the organization that brought this today transmit that uh, directly to DPP, regardless of what this board does. You know, what I'm struggling with right now is I'm just going, trying to go through ordinance by ordinance. Uh, I'm not sure every citation is correct, but I'm not going to hold that against the group because there was a lot of. Uh, detailed research that went into this. I'm just trying to bring up the ordinances that are being mentioned, and seeing if they say what they're claimed to be and said. So I'm inclined to abstain. I'm not going to vote against. Um, and the reason is just because in real time, I'm having trouble, uh, you know, fact checking some of the specifics here. Uh, but I appreciate the expertise of the speaker earlier. Uh, but that being said, you know, if this is like a claim for DPP, and I think Corinne may have been, you know, moving towards this direction, you know, there are attorneys at DPP that can be communicated to it, uh, and they're an actual decision-making body in this, as opposed to uh, just the neighborhood board. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Ian. Okay, um, since we heard someone in abstention, uh, if we have someone who would like to speak for the resolution, Let's try and have someone. Chair. Oh. Yes, yeah. Thomas. So this is speaking as someone who opposed the resolution last time, but I am leaning in favor this time. And that's not necessarily because I now agree with, um, you know, those who have come up uh, in support of the resolution tonight. I'm left with, and I think Ian sort of was leaning towards this, um, realizing that I am not an expert able to dissect all of these claims. I don't have the background to do so. But there needs to be a venue of experts to be able to discuss these issues. And the fact that that isn't available is disappointing. And if we are the, you know, as it was said, the purpose of the neighborhood board is to facilitate um, participation in government. And I do feel like those venues to be able to find the answers to these questions need to be there. And that's why I'm leaning in support of this resolution tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. So that was a speech in favor. Uh, do we have someone against? Okay, John. We have a bill seven that said, let's try and get it done. We got an instance. We said, 
you didn't do it right. We got to say, go back and do it again right. Uh, so we don't have to worry about it because DPP and the city council will finish the voting. We don't, we can't do the construction ourselves, but uh, I think it's very clear what we want. We need enough information that we can decide. And they refuse to come back and say about the. They really want to go that tall. I really don't, really don't want them to. So uh, that's kind of where we are. Okay, I believe that was a, also a speech in favor of the resolution. Yeah. Uh, so here, uh, I'll give one more opportunity for opposition, or I guess in Ian's case, abstention, uh, to speak before we'll go no, ahead. No, sure. I've, I've had enough uh, to say. I, I, my hand was just unintentionally kept up. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Okay, if we could go ahead and roll call vote. Roll call on the um, resolution. In op the vote is on the resolution in opposition of the uh, 1617 Alapai Street project. Member Baldwin. Aye. Aye. Member Carson. Aye, reluctantly uh, due Aye. to uh, ADA issues. Fujinaka. Absent. Granger. Absent. Kawano. Aye. Aye. Plink. Absent. Kojima. Absent. Lakalaka Manapuna. Manapuna is I. Okay. Lee. I. Mitchell. Mitchell is having problems with his mic. His vote is in the chat, if that's acceptable. Mitchell. He, po he uh, posted in the chat. His vote is yes. Yes. I. Nakamoto. I. Peck. Absent. I. Ross. Oh, Peck here. I. Ross. Abstention. Abstain. Uh, Salasa. Absent. Santos. Aye. Aye. Steelquist. Aye. Aye. Char. Aye. A vote count. A vote of 11 ayes, zero no votes, one abstention. Uh, motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, where are we? Okay. Okay, so we are still on the uh, discussion of proposed affordable housing building at 6017 Alapai Street. Are there any final remarks before we move on? Go ahead. Hi, uh, so, uh, Rich. I've spoken before about um, an existing Bill 7 and uh, using that as a reference of how disconnected that all lamb is with the development as well as transparency and the amount of uh, disconnects of the people, the drugs, the other things that I've complained about. Uh, the board's been really great to help uh, facilitate the cleanup a little bit of that. And now it's just of, um, it's a very bad situation when the developer doesn't get involved and be a, a steward to help us uh, in the neighborhood just build and leave. So I think that should be something that, you know, as we try to get Paul Lamb here to discuss and be part of that. But I think um, that should be very important that uh, the developers that are doing this should be a good steward for the neighborhood as well and be there and at least support what they're trying to do. And the transparency is really important for all of us because it just gets to be uh, one-sided, they build and they leave, and it becomes very uh, disconnected with all of us. But uh, using us as an example, ask me any questions and I'll let you know what's going on, but thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Carol? Thank you. I just wanted to um, 
add some background, you know, as um, bill 7 was originally presented to the council. It was characterized as a way for us to really uh, improve aging communities, you know, and to um, refurbish aging apartments and most of the examples that we were given were all in areas that are generally flat, you know, Makiki, Makali, Mo'ili, Ili. And these are also areas that the city is currently looking at increasing density as part of their plans for the PUCDP. With Bill 7, I think part of what is happening is that even though it was very well intended, the first one of the first projects that uh, initially came up in this region was Pence Metro. That's a project that was um, on Pensacola Street. It's not yet completed. You know, some projects have gone through a lot of problems. Others are good projects. But I raised concerns with the department on the um, Ernest Street project that um, that gentleman spoke about earlier, and um, you know was pretty much brushed off by the developer. I was very disappointed. But you know I represent this area, and they never contacted me. I will say that the project that they have done on Kinal Street to me is a good example of the kind of positive projects that Bill Seven could develop. It's a small scale project. It's very um, close to the Hawaii Public Housing Authority structure at the corner of Piikoi and Kinal Street. It's right behind a uh, Safeway parking lot. And that's the kind of infill that sort of respects the surrounding community. So, you know, I, I encourage the board to uh, keep at it. I will certainly reach out to the developer and ask that he take into account many of the concerns that have been raised tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Okay. Okay. Um, with that, I believe. Oh, sorry. Uh, sure. We'll go ahead and entertain one more. Go for it. I will be very brief. Um, I, I'm the president of the board of Kahale Moy, some 106 units representing over 200 children, women, and men. I have a letter here in opposition to the project at 1617 Alapai. I'd like to present that to you. It is from the board of directors of our Kahale Moy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Claire, go ahead and then we'll continue on with the agenda. Thank you very much. It's been three months of presenting information and trying to convince the board and, um, Reminding everyone here, this board is not judge and jury. We're not a legislative body. We are here to represent and support you. And by adopting this resolution, we have done our job. It is not for us to ferret out ordinances, laws and all that, but you folks went above and beyond to present to us the information we needed to make our best decision. So I want to commend my community because yes, I do live in that area. Um, I want to commend my community for stepping up and, and taking hold of this project and doing the research. Um, the developers will take advantage where they can. I have, I left this on the East coast 40 years ago. It's the same thing coming again. I'm, I'm one step ahead of these guys. I've seen what they've done ruining small towns and ruining neighborhoods. Um, but to keep it on a high note, thank you to the board. It, it took it took a few rounds, but we got there and um, thank you to the community for stepping up, doing the research and, and making your voice heard. And I hope you'll use the neighborhood board in the future for future projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. And, and thank you very much to everyone who showed up in support of this, uh, this agenda item. Thank you so much. Uh, and with that, we'll go ahead and move forward with the agenda. Uh, next up, we have the nice neighborhood committee report. Thank you very much chair uh, Harris Nakamoto reporting on the nice neighborhood committee. Um, our next meeting is uh, there's agenda. Our next meeting is set for September 30th Monday. We have our meetings on the last Monday, uh, 2 PM of every month. Um, coming up. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the concerns that uh, was raised on the 1525 Leo Leo. Also, we're doing some follow up items. We had a very robust discussion. 
regarding the punch bowl perimeter, which was actually brought through by 666 Prospect Street uh, residents. So um, I'd like to really commend, um, we really had a great uh, initial discussion with the city, state, and federal uh, to look at this, uh, this area. And then also we'll be starting the discussions about resilience hubs. So I uh, um, ask that if there's interest in these areas that uh, people uh, tune into the meetings. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, uh, Harris. And next up, we have the candidate forum permitted interaction group report. Uh, so I distributed the quick down and dirty uh, kind of a plan for what we're going to do come October. Uh, so currently, the plan is to about 715 to call a recess and hold uh, a candidate forum. The plan is to have Andrew Garrett and Jeffrey Imamura of House District 22. So that's part of Makiki and Manoa, and then also see if we can get our local OHA candidates uh, to show up. So that would be Kali'i Kali Akina and Le'ahi Isa. No, oh, Ahu Isa, excuse me. Um, are there any questions? It's basically the same as what we did last year, or not last year, two, two years ago. <laughs> time, time flies when we're having fun. Um, yeah. Okay, seeing none, uh, this is the report and I hope we can adopt it next round. Uh, Chair, is there a clearer way than raising my hands to uh, get attention? Uh, oh, should I, should I just speak up in the future? Or? Okay, uh, I, I guess you should um, ask for attention. Sorry, I guess. Um, no, no, it's worse. A bit of problems. Go for it, Ian. Yeah, no problem. I'll just make sure to be in person next month. Uh, so real briefly, I had a couple of questions on this. Did Jeffries, um, the candidate for the Manoa Makiki seat, say yes? I have not heard anything back yet. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, and the next one was, uh, is there, I know we discussed, I thought we were at inviting all OHA candidates. Are we just inviting the Oahu seat OHA candidates? Uh, yes, we decided to only have the Oahu candidates. Okay. Uh, I just want to note then that I was uh, in support of inviting o OHA candidates because, you know, in Hawaii, we don't vote for OHA candidates based on what island we live on. We vote for all islands. So Oahu largely is the deciding factor for every OHA seat. So I just wanted to register that I was in support of expanding that to anyone who wanted to uh, attend virtually. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Okay, uh, I guess we can go ahead and actually adopt, uh, take on your advice uh, for inviting all the OHA candidates. Um, granted, we will likely have to shorten the number of questions given how many OHA candidates there are. Yeah, absolutely. That that would be the un that would be the difficult part there. But it is a chance for us to meet uh, all the candidates on our ballot. Yes. Yeah, that would be that would be great. Invite them all. <laughs> Rare opportunity, and since we're already hybrid. <laughs> Yeah, so so it is an opportunity, and we'll see who takes the bait. <laughs> uh, I'll also go ahead because that increases the number of people we have to volunteer. I'll volunteer to do the outreach. Okay, awesome. Thank, you, thank you much, you much Ian. Okay, are there any other comments or uh, questions about the, the report? Seeing none, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, next up is supporting a protective fence at Makiki Community Gardens. Uh, is someone here to speak on that? I believe I was. Yeah, I, um, oh, I'm, on, I'm on. I am. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, so I didn't come in in person. But um, my name is Adam Strubeck, um, uh, applications officer for the Makiki Community Garden. Um, at our monthly garden meetings, we've had members largely in support of a garden fence, um, and we've. Kind of been in talks with the city as well about a possible garden fence. Um, they seem to be quoting us quite a large amount, like $170,000 to do a garden fence. Um, so we think that maybe with in kind uh, donations of labor and materials, we might be able to do something a lot cheaper. 
but I think overall we just like the support of the neighborhood board um, to kind of when we do have more concrete plans that we bring to DPR that they're kind of um, understanding that the community is like behind us while we while we do so. Um, so I'm open to your discussion or recommendations on like the best form that support would take. Um, but yeah, I, I guess ultimately I'm speaking in support of a fence at the community garden. Yep, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, I will open it up to the board and I see Ian's hand up. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so Adam, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, two quick questions for you. One, what do you foresee is what the fence can do? Uh, for example, I mean, if everyone has a key, effectively no one has a key, right? And two, would it impede walking around the park at all? Um, yeah, so I think the idea of the fence is to is threefold, really. So it's to separate elements of the park, um, kind of like the tennis courts have a fence. Um, so like separating elements of the park would um, kind of improve circulation. We've had instances where kids are running through the garden um, and then it kind of presents a safety issue because the lack of the fence also uh, means that homeless people are kind of hanging out in the garden sometimes. So we have had issues where like kids are running into homeless people kind of in the garden and having these kind of uh, weird interactions, I guess. Um, you know, we found human waste and things of that nature in the garden. So I think um, safety and accessibility improvements are kind of an issue that we're looking at. Um, I think the idea is that the garden fence would have a number of gates um, kind of similar to how our garden shed has like a number of keys that are distributed to key garden members. Um, this is the same system that a lot of other commu urban community gardens have in town. Um, and I do think that Makiki is kind of the most urban garden, so it does make sense to have a fence there. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious, like, um, if the gates are always open, what impact does the fence have? Or is it only locked at night? Uh, I'm just kind yeah, of unsure. Like, how does, someone get, to, how does think, someone get to their plot if they don't have a key? Right. I think the idea is that it would be locked at night and then opened in the morning. Um, yeah. We do have a number of gardeners that live in like adjacent buildings, so those gardeners would probably be the ones, as well as officers that would maybe have a key. Um, and the other key note, I think, is that HPD has expressed to us that if a homeless person enters the garden now, there's really not much of, that they can do. Um, but if there is a fence there, they can actually trespass people out of the garden. They're, they won't be able to go into the garden and, and bring people out physically. They've expressed that they don't want to do that now because of kind of like the ambush risk in the aisles. Um, but having the having an, having an enclosable fence would allow them to entice people to come out of the garden and then be able to trespass them. Um, so as well as a physical barrier, there's kind of like a, a legislative barrier there as well. Okay, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Adam, as a former plot holder at Dole Community Garden, I understand the need for the fence. Um, it keeps out wandering people. A lot of homeless people do come with bolt cutters. I did share a few of my harvests, um, my asparagus and my beans in particular. Uh, it kind of comes with the territory, but I do wholeheartedly agree that a fence around the property with locks that responsible people will unlock in the morning during gardening hours um, is a good safety precaution for you folks to take and I'm glad to hear about it. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, would a board member like to entertain a motion to support the a, a protective fence like Markiki Community Gardens? I'd make the motion. Second. Okay, uh, so we now have a motion to support protect defense at Makiki Community Gardens. Uh, we're now entering into discussion. Is there any discussion? I discussed. <laughs> yeah. Um, is anyone, uh, is there anyone opposed or abstaining from the motion? Oh, sorry, Ian, your hand is up. Oh, I'm just going to. 
a take on harping on this each time, seeing as one of our parks is recently going up to sale. Uh, it'd be really nice that if uh, any proceeds that come from selling of some of our parks go towards improvement of other parks. Thank you very much for uh, indulging me with that comment, Chair. I'll be sure to bring up every time we're uh, fundraising for park issues. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, okay, one more time. Seeing is anyone opposed or abstaining from the motion? Ian, your hand is still up. Okay, seeing none, uh, the motion passes. Is there any further discussion on this uh, agenda item? Seeing none, thank you very much, uh, Adam. Yeah, thank you, and board members. Appreciate it. And yeah, if anything comes up that we can definitely support a little harder, uh, bring it to us. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. Uh, discussion of safety concerns at the laundromat on Liho Liho Street. Is there anyone here to speak on that? Seeing none. Uh, I'll, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, seeing none, I guess I'll talk about it a little bit. So the concern was brought up a couple month, a couple months ago now. Um, so the door to the laundromat fell on a lady while she was using it. It is our only community laundromat within a fairly large distance. Um, so taking any action against it, uh, obviously there's a bit of a fine line we have to tread between taking too harsh an action and losing our only laundromat or going too light and it's still presenting a bit of a safety hazard. So um, I guess if uh, our city council people, <laughs> if anyone, uh, and Carol and um, Tom, if there's anything we can do uh, or you guys can do that we can get behind you and support you for this, uh, please let us know. Okay, uh, moving on to the discussion on concerns of squatters at 1525 Liho Liho Street. Do you have anyone to speak? For that, Harris? Yeah, there's a concern that was brought up at a couple of meetings already, and I was just interested. So I, I drove by just to see. Uh, originally, I thought it was a home and people were squatting it in in a abandoned home, but actually, it's it's kind of raised, and there's a protective screening, like a construction screening. But there's an entrance; it's wide open. So there's this couple of encampments inside there, and and on the way into along the the roadside, there's a lot of lot of rubbish that's continuing to go in. So it's becoming a dump site also. Um, so I'm I'm uh, definitely concerned about uh, this. A uh, plot of land that's becoming like a, like a, a um, squatters, uh, and you know whether it be, um, you know activities. On one side, there's an apartment, and this this plot is in between uh, apartments, and then I think there's a preschool, a driveway parking area to a preschool. So. Um, so I brought it up to, uh, and that's one of the discussions that's coming up in terms of with our nice neighborhood. So um, we wanna continue to address it with our uh, representatives and our council uh, in that area. Okay, well, I was gonna say, uh, I saw Ian's hand up first and then I'll recognize uh, Jenny. Ian. Uh, you let Jenny go first. I've had a few speaking opportunities. Okay. I do have an update on this though. Sorry, I'm unaware of how far back um, people are aware of. I live on that street. I knew the previous owners who actually owned two houses on that plot and the squatters and some of the um, transients that set it on fire. And every night when I go home, they're still setting fires at night to like keep warm and stuff. So just kind of, hey, if we can increase the uh, HPD patrols or something, I know we've got security in the area. I've seen API and couple of the companies that patrol and stuff and kind of go over with, you know, with Aloha, like, uncle, you got to put the fire out, but, you know, it's definitely a hazard that it's going to happen again. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, Ian. 
Thank you very much, Chair. So I've been talking to some of the neighbors for a while on this issue, and it's something I've been in contact with uh, Councilman Perse's office, though I do owe them a, a follow-up email. So the steps I've taken so far is it, uh, as I mentioned in a previous meeting, I think one way forward is when we when people identify squatters there, if they're not the property owner, they're often told that you, you can't call for trespassing on property you don't own. I also understand there's no, no trespassing signs currently up. That's my current understanding. Um, the issue to me seems that the most straightforward thing is we need to get uh, in touch with the new owners. And I, and I think this would be great for them too. get some sort of legal deal paperwork signed with the neighbors, allowing them the right to call for trespassing. I think that's sort of the way forward. So to this end, I've used some online services. I've used uh, some things that neighbors have given me as potential numbers and I've not been able to get in touch with anyone. And I've been calling through Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, UH Manoa's Richardson Law School, trying to find someone who might be able to do this pro bono. And for this type of property law, it doesn't really seem like there's a market for a pro bono assistance. So I've been getting in touch with some of the, I think the Bar Association's Lawyer Referral Information Services. They don't think there's anything pro bono for something like this, but they're trying to find some lawyers who might want to take something like this on. And that's where I'm at on it. I can I can definitely attest to the fact that neighbors are incredibly frustrated. But the two holdups I'm seeing right now for the board actually effectively coming up with maybe not a solution, but a great mitigating is one, getting the new owner on the phone and two, finding an attorney who can do this type of work for us at a rate that's acceptable to the neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Chuck. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to ask if Ian doesn't mind if he, um, those people that he's been in contact with, with uh, 1525 Leo, Leo, if they wouldn't mind attending the nice neighborhood um, meeting that we have coming up on the 30th. Ian? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll look forward to you emailing or texting you all the associated details. Thank you. Thank you. Harris. Um, on this call, uh, is there a council member says representative, or is council member on this call or present? They're not. Oh, okay. Are there any other representatives that um, that would cover the area that could provide some input that in terms of uh, how the process, maybe in terms of when you have this type of residence or uh, property that is is being, I guess, occupied by people who actually shouldn't be occupying that area and, and creating, whether it be drug activity, whether it be a help activity uh, or safety concerns to the community, how is that addressed uh, in terms of you know, uh, ways other than, you know, having, you know, going through a whole legal process and so forth. I was going to say Tom. <laughs> oh, and uh, Carol. We would contact Honolulu Police Department and seek their assistance and then try and contact the owner. If the owner is reluctant to intervene, then I think there will need to be, you know, some assistance from a city agency who could work with HPD because in this instance, has anybody tried to contact the owner? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. I shared that I have. Yes, thank you. Okay, were you able to um, locate the owner and um, Find the way to have the owner sign off on allowing the neighbors to assist because getting some sort of agreement together is pretty straightforward. I would think uh, I, if you can come together on it. Yes, so that's one reason why I was pursuing that type of action. So okay. there's a few services that give uh, profiles. So the okay. owner name is listed online as Go Leho LLC. And there's two associated phone numbers. I'm not sure if I should share them in this meeting, but I'll happily email them to you, Senator, uh, along with an email oh, address, which I haven't reached out to yet. But I haven't gotten any contact. No one's responded. Okay. Well, if you have that information, then we'll follow up offline. Yep. Thank you very much, Carol. Okay. Does anyone have anything else on this uh, 1525? 
before it turns into another 1421 Pensacola. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's really why we're talking about it, because that if we could stop this from becoming a many years long drag, I hope to nip it in the bud. And I hope I'm I imagine I'm voicing the same concern everyone else has. So um, seeing no one else, I will go ahead and move on. Uh, discussion on establishing a new dog park at the Punahou Square Park. Uh, do we have any new information on that? See. <laughs> okay, we were given three choices of the dog park, uh, one of which is Makiki District Park. Second one is Baratania Square, right there in the corner of uh, Punahou and Baratania. And the third one is uh, a little, a little bit of a park, which is uh, too small, uh, up uh, about two blocks of Malka from the uh, Lutheran uh, Church, right in there. But that was, I think that was less than 3,000 square feet. And that was, the Parks Department said they had like to have at least 3,000 square feet square feet so uh that's what so nobody's done anything since we were given this how long ago a month ago six months ago it's been quite a few months i, I believe we actually voted last time to um support a park at the put square park Okay, seeing no further discussion on the dog park, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to follow up discussion on the opposition to the P.E. Koi mini park sale. Do we have anyone to speak on that? Uh, yeah, so, um, well, actually, I believe Ian can speak better on that. I. I'm not as good about following that particular issue. Is that, is that a done deal, Ian? Uh, thank you very much. I believe the resolution was passed, so uh, authorizing sales isn't the same thing, I think, as finalizing sales. But I believe the city council has done their weighing in. Um, I don't know if it's a formality now for department action. Um, you know, there was some sharing, of course, and, and I uh, voiced my concern about it, that the board hadn't weighed in on this issue or was mixed. And certainly the board holds many different opinions. Um, but uh, as I had shared uh, at a previous meeting, I think it was in uh, April, we did take a vote to do a current blanket opposition, which is still the board's position, unless we pass another resolution or uh, motion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Thank you very much for the update, Ian. Um, okay, seeing no further discussion, that that's the end of our board business and moving on to state of Hawaii elected official reports. Thank you so much for waiting. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the governor, Josh Green's representative, Russell Pang. Okay. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Just trying to. Can't seem to turn on my camera, so I apologize there. Yeah, it's not letting me. Oh, there I am. Okay. Community concerns. I'm sorry, I just, Go ahead. did we skip community concerns? Uh, no, that's coming up after the city and county. Honolulu yeah, I apologize. Election. I apologize. No problem. Go ahead, Russell. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, chair. So I, I will throw the governor's newsletter into the chat room after my report. Um, I am glad that the uh, community member brought up the homeless situation along P.E. Koi and Pensacola. So I do appreciate that. I did want to let, excuse me, did want to let the uh, community know that uh, the Department of Transportation and Department of Hawaiian Homelands will be doing another homeless sweep um, near the Royal Vista condos on Prospect Street uh, sometime in early October. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, 
sorry about that. <clears throat> um, in addition, the DOT does other homeless sweeps along Little Lilo Street, um, as was discussed earlier, between Picoy and Pensacola. Um, we do that several times a month. Other areas include Magellan Avenue um, along the H1 where the overhangs are across from Dole Park and at the intersection of Miller Street. Also at the Matikin Skate Park along uh, the Luna Lilo Band area. And finally, we also do homeless suites regularly at Cartwright Park uh, on the Mackay side of H1 as well as um, Whitney Street on the on the Malka side of H1. So we do those suites regularly. We partner with uh, the Department of Transport uh, with Hoi um, Honolulu uh, Police Department as well as um, social service agencies. Our crews as well as our contractor go out and give advance notice before doing the sweeps. We talk to the individuals who are there um, to give them warning that this is going to be happening and try to provide them with the assistance that they may need to um, uh, get off the streets and, and find the services that they may need. So we do appreciate HPD's assistance on that. And um, if you are aware of other locations that are near the freeways or other state uh, properties, please uh, let me know and our, our team can go out there and investigate and come up with some sort of course of action working with HPD and the social service agencies. Um, and that's all I have for tonight. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Russell. Uh, I see there are already questions and hands up. Uh, did I? I'll start with Jenny because she hardly gets it. Oh, okay, your hand is up. Okay, Chuck. Uh, yeah, Russell. Um, you know the uh, the Luna Lilo P Koi area that we're just you were just talking about and we were talking about earlier. Um, that property that is, I guess it's uh, the city now. You guys renting it out? DOT is renting it out to uh, DFM from the city. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. You mean under, I mean under the the freeway. Is yes. What you're talking about. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, my my concern is, um, I know you guys did a really good job, um, you know, helping HPD and the city clean up that place. But what what happens over there that concerns me is that there's still people that go back to that area occasionally, and they they dump a lot of rubbish over the fence, and they're starting to tear down. I don't know if they're deliberately starting to tear down the fence, but the, the, the fence is starting to rip again. And, you know, once that happens, it's just going to keep going. So I was wondering if anybody could look at that and see what they could do about it, because that is government property, right? Yes, that's correct. No, th thanks for raising that. Um, that is an ongoing um, concern, definitely. Um, as you know, you know uh, we, we go out there make several sweeps and cleanups in the area um, throughout the month. Uh, you may see the big blue uh, trucks that are out there from HTM contractors. Um, but you, you are correct. They, they, the individuals go back pretty quickly. And so it's a, it's a constant um, struggle. But thanks for bringing the attention to my attention the fence. Uh, I'll, I'll raise that with our crew and we'll see if we can address that. But I, I just want to make sure that you understand how much we appreciate you guys doing that because it's much improved. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and we appreciate the community's input as well, because we couldn't do this without the community's input as well. Okay, uh, are there any? Oh, Richard. Uh, Russell, uh, the November meeting, could the governor give us a short, like, 3 minute report on what activities you folks have been in? To address homelessness, housing. I know there's the uh, uh, Ala Respite Center, and there's this bus. Yeah, give us a quick report on the steps that have been taken and uh, the progress you folks have made in addressing homelessness. I can put that request in um, from the governor's homeless coordinator, John Mizuno. I believe you, um, you folks have met with him. Is that correct? Um, or at least you were trying to meet with him. Um, and, uh, I don't believe but, John Mizuno's shown up at this board yet. No, no, not not at the board. Uh, I, I believe that there was going to be other meetings um, that um, we're going 
John was going to meet with members of the board and also um, discuss some of the concerns prior to coming to one of the meetings. Did that not take place? Uh, I guess would that have been with the nice neighborhoods, Harris and Chuck? Did John Mizuno meet with you guys? John Mizuno and uh, Sam Moku uh, joined a call that was tied into that 1454 Canal Street. And mm -hmm. what we talked to them about was as we progress in the cleanup of that area and then the movement of the encampments was actually to, and they're still involved with the nice neighborhoods in terms of the, I guess, the strategy in terms of addressing that movement in terms of whether if it's homelessness, health issues, or drug activity. And so how to kind of stratify and uh, address those types of uh, encampments. So they've been involved and, uh, uh, and they continue to be involved with uh, the different areas. It's same with the 66 uh, prospect, uh, they were involved. Uh, so as we move along the, um, the state and the, the city um, have uh, participated. Okay, thank okay. you very much, Harris. Thank you, yep. Are there any other questions for the governor's representative? Does anyone have anything from the uh, residents? Okay, go ahead and come up. And if you could give us your name, please. So I'm Nina Burke from 1454 Kinao Street. And I just uh, wanted to thank, especially Harris Nakamoto and the whole team with Nice Neighborhoods. HPD, and now I'm finding out DOT as well because you guys really cleaned up our our neighborhood. It's like we were living with drug addicts day in and day out, 24/7, and it was really, really rough for a long time. And I'm glad that they're getting offered help now, and that we can use our sidewalks again. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to see watch old women, old ladies walking on the street, and people having to take their kids in strollers on the street with cars coming because they can't walk on the sidewalk. So, our quality of life is so much better now. And just want to definitely thank you all. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate all you do. Thank you very much, Harris. Yeah, I just like to uh, thank actually thank Nina and the residents because uh, they all came together, and that's 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 the essence of when we talk about nice neighborhoods. And they've also been able to embrace uh, when we've had uh, the meetings at Six 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 Prospect. They actually came because they felt uh, appreciative of what was going on. But um, I'm I'm really um, Really pleased that as as to uh, the continuation and uh, I, I think the the pride of, you know part of nice neighborhoods is tied to community pride and uh, I really see it uh, and and uh, thank uh, Nina and and all the residents in your area thank you okay thank you very much um, do you have anyone else who would like to Speak with or any questions for the governor's representative. Seeing none, thank you very much, Russell. And we'll move on to thank you, Senator uh, Carol Fukunaga. Thank you. Um, I had copies of my report that were um, sent out to everyone earlier this um, week. I wanted to kind of highlight. The fact that the um, Aala Respite Center is open is also a really valuable resource for us. You know, as we've been working with IHS and um, the um, H, not H4, but um, uh, Homeless Services Group that takes care of the other half of Makiki, they said that this could really make a big difference. And so I'm um, thankful 
that it has opened. It will augment what we also have at Behavioral Health Center um, in Ivole. Just some quick updates. Uh, I know everybody else has been talking about our little fire ant forum coming up next week. Just as you know, we've been talking about how homeless have been moving in and around uh, Punchbowl. We have reports of little fire ants in the Papakolea and surrounding area. So we don't want them spreading both Mauka as well as Makai. So next week we do have a group of uh, experts from the little fire ant lab as well as Department of Ag and um, the Oahu Invasive Species Committee coming. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, board is doing some amazing work. You all deserve a lot of thanks for stepping up and taking back community. Okay. Starting with the board, are there anyone with any questions for so the senator? Seeing none, uh, do any of the residents have any questions for the senator? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Carol. Okay, moving on to Representative Del Albalati's office. Nathan, I'm online. Can you hear me? Awesome. Thank you um, for my report. I just want to actually build off of uh, Claire's Harris's and Senator uh, Fukunaga's comments. I just, I'm so proud to be a part of this community when I see the kind of engagement, uh, thorough discussion and the care with which uh, the community approaches all of the challenges we have. Um, I've been working along with Harris uh, to, to watch him in action and the tremendous work he's doing with nice neighborhoods is fantastic. I think um, on my part, what I would like to share in just in addition to the little fire and one of the things I'm engaging in as we move towards the 2025 legislative session is that all of these great projects we see all of the work we see being done with homeless services kudos to Governor Green's team. All of this takes funding. So, 1 of the things I've been really focused on, and this really grows out of actually. Um, a legislative follow up session that I had with the community in May at Queen Kahomanu, where we were talking about funding challenges. And so, what I've been doing and uh, working on for the past couple of months, and what's rolling out now, is a project called Crafting a, Crafting a People's Budget. And we really want to educate. Uh, I'm working with a few colleagues of mine in the House, Representatives Peruso and Representative Capella, uh, to, to educate the community about the budget process and how you can get engaged to support all of these important programs, particularly, you know, as I listen to um, people here, the important human services, health and human services programs that are often the very ones that are ignored and underfunded. So I've been rolling out um, a number of a series of webinars they are going to happen in October. We're going to be doing a, an in person workshop in, in mid to late October. I will get that information out to you quickly when we finalize dates and logistics. But I invite you to be part of this process of learning about how the state budget gets constructed. Again, some of the things that we're seeing happening uh, with um, Governor Green's Kohale, uh, the, the uh, service providers like IHS and uh, H4, H3RC, uh, these folks depend on state funding. State funding that has not been uh, raised in some cases uh, in over a decade. So when you think about all of the cost of living expenses that you experience, we are probably paying poverty wages to the folks who are doing homeless out outreach. And so if we want to keep seeing those programs happen, again, I encourage you to uh, get involved. I'll be sending out more information and logistics so that you can better understand the budget process. And just as you folks have done such a great job in organizing in the community, come and um, advocate at the legislature for the pro programs that you, uh, you think are important and deserve to be funded. Uh, I'll end with that, Nathan, and I'm happy to take any questions. Chuck. Yeah, I just wanted to commend um, Representative Baladi on putting on that forum. I was fortunate enough to go on the one they just had on Sunday. Well attended, uh, so much good information. She was able to get uh, Governor Ige and some other really, really good speakers. And a lot of transparency and a lot of things that um, the general public really doesn't know about what's going on with the budget. So I highly encourage everybody to attend. 
I'll start with oh. something I would add to that, uh, Chair. Oh, sorry, something I would oh, add to okay. that, Chair. Yes. We have a partnership in putting. We have a partnership with, with Olelo, and we are recording all of these sessions. Um, I will uh, make this available in links to the board as well as to any public members. Um, and I'm in the process of creating a, a YouTube page where I will make sure that these videos and webinars are posted so that anyone who wants to learn, wasn't able to join us, can go back and review uh, those learning opportunities. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, okay, we'll go with uh, Claire. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to reiterate what Chuck Lee said. Uh, I did also attend Sunday's presentation on, on budgeting and uh, Governor Ige's uh, thought processes. I, I did learn so much about the thought process about behind the big picture and how to come at these decisions and make uh, uh, make these budgets and figure out priorities. So I do. I did record it. If anyone wants to watch, but. Um, I do encourage the community to listen in on that and, and under, get a deeper understanding of how some of these decisions come about. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Harris. I'd like to thank uh, Representative uh, for uh, really supporting and, and really her energy to, to lean in for the community. You know, one of the things I, I, I think we should also uh, be cognizant of is, especially in, in this area, uh, Makiki, but also towards uh, King Street area, there are many businesses that are being affected by uh, this, the homeless uh, areas. And so at, at many times, actually, they go out of business because it's too expensive for them to continue to uh, fight against the situation. So as advocates uh, for this area, we should, uh, in terms of looking at funding and the, the bigger picture, it's also looking at our small business owners and, and supporting them uh, because they definitely um, uh, contribute to the community itself. Okay, is there any other comments or questions from the board for Richard? Uh, Rep. Bilotti, um this is more on the legislative process, but any, what can you tell us about the gut and replace uh, discussion, which is something I would like to see done away with? Well, the, the Supreme Court has effectively um, shut that practice down, but I think um, what you might be referring to, Richard, is of course, you know, through legislative processes, there's always ways to kind of circumvent that. I think, you know, the legislature has done a better job of not gutting and replacing anything. We just need to make sure, um, I think as we also have budget uh, discussions, we are also having a robust discussion about reforms. Um, and reforms can take the shape of rules reforms that the legislature can do internally to kind of curb and, and um, add guardrails to the way we handle things like those kinds of last minute uh, decisions that, that can still be made in conference committee. Um, so we are working on that. And, and um, again, I think it's, it's about vigilance of the community, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe we have time for, uh, if anyone from the residents would like to ask a question. Seeing none, thank you very much, Tom and Della. Would I be able to ask a question, Chair? Oh, shoot, I did not see your hand. Okay. Uh, no problem. Yeah. You, you got to cut off at some point, but if no residents want to take it up, I'd still like to include mine. Um, representative, of course, uh, since the Fall Aid Commission came up with a number of ethics reforms, uh, many of them, even most, have been adopted, but a significant number still haven't been adopted. What would you say the appetite is among your colleagues for picking those up at, um, with enthusiasm like we've seen in previous years towards adoption of some of the other measures? Thank you. I, great question, um, Ian. I think there, there is, there's certainly an appetite from the public to continue uh, to look at some of the Foley reforms as well as others. Um, and so I think because the public has an appetite, our, um, my colleagues will also have an appetite. I certainly am willing to always look at different kinds of reforms, both rules for legislative bodies, statutes that affect policies. Um, and then of course, there's always constitutional amendments. So we need to look at all 
um, the all the avenues in which we can uh, we, we in which we can pursue reforms, and I'm certainly willing to help champion that cause. Thanks, Ian, for the question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Della and Tom, <laughs> and we'll go ahead and uh, move on to uh, Representative Scott Nishimoto. Uh, seeing no one here for that, uh, Representative Andrew Garrett. Hey, good evening, Chair. Uh, I'll keep this uh, relatively short. I know you've had a full agenda today. Just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, thanking the board for your interest in hosting a candidate forum. I think it's really important that the voters hear directly from the candidates. And I'm hoping the other candidate in the race for how, uh, State House District 22 uh, accepts the offer, and I'm looking forward to that uh, lively discussion at that time. Just for members of the audience who might not know the boundaries of District 22, it is primarily Manoa Valley, but it does come over into Makiki a little bit. So just by uh, reference, the EVA boundary of District 22 is Punahou Street. Then if you work your way, Malka, it does make a left at Dominus Street. And then once it hits Makiki, it goes straight up to the top of Round Top Drive. So that's basically the, the western end of uh, District 22. And I think some of you folks, uh, members included, live in that area. So again, thank you for offering to host that forum. Uh, secondly, just want to thank the residents of Top Brown Top Drive. I know living up on the, the mountain is very serene, but some of the challenges is that it's very isolated. So when there are landslides, unfortunately, the community can get cut off. So we did hear from a few of the neighbors after the latest landslide. And although the county or the road ended up being um, a part of the county, we're always happy to try to problem solve as much as possible. So we did reach out to the county folks. Um, there's a lot of state land owned up there as well by DLNR. Uh, it turned out it was owned by a, a private landowner. That's the tree that came down that triggered the landslide. So it took a little bit of time, but the private landowner did clear that site. And I know there's a unfettered access again, but again, if there's ever any issues in the neighborhood, please feel, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to try to do our part to resolve it. So with that, I'll stop there and see if there are any uh, questions this evening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rep. Garrett. Uh, any questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, any questions from any residents? Seeing none, thank you very much, Rev. Garrett. See you folks next we'll month. Take next care. Week. Absolutely. Okay, uh, moving on to city and county of Honolulu elected official reports. Uh, with, starting with Mayor Rick Blangiardi's representative office of housing, executive director, Denise Isari Matsubara. Uh, she couldn't make it, so moving on to City Council Member Calvin Say. Okay, so both council members are. I, I forgot if uh, Hector. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and. Uh, so no one's here for Calvin Say. Is anyone here for Tyler Dos Santos Tam? Yeah, yeah, I got his report. It's just double checking. Um, okay, and then moving on to resident community concerns, and I believe uh, Corinne had a concern. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I I just want to say something about affordable housing. Um, so I, I think it's fairly obvious that. Uh, if you put three single adults in three separate one bedroom or studio apartments versus having those three single adults share a three bedroom unit, um, that they're going to occupy less square footage and the construction costs would be lower because those adults are having, you know, three people sharing one kitchen and one bathroom as opposed to three separate apartment units. Um, and then in most communities, the rent per Per individual would be significantly cheaper. Um, it's also the same for families, large families, uh, and people who want to live with their extended family. It's always a great way to save money if you can bring some relatives in and share the rent. Um, and some people just prefer to live that way because they want to be close to family. They want to help their mother out, um, you know, if she falls or whatever. Um, and I think Honolulu, I, I've lived in a lot of places, and um, this is where I plan to die. But one thing that I find very odd is there seems to be a huge lack of two, three, and four bedroom 
housing units, just period. Everything is a one bedroom. Um, and unless you, I guess, have enough money to buy a single family home and who has that. So, um, I, I, and I, when I look into the, um, the subsidies that the city and county and state and, you know, are providing developers, it appears that they're strongly incentivized to build as many small, tiny units as possible to maximize uh, their profit. But if maybe if you can make incentives were, you know, different, um, we could actually house people more affordably if we provided uh, more multifamily, I mean, more multi bedroom units. I have a lot of friends who have kids who have, you know, children, uh, three kids sharing one bedroom or, you know, kids sleeping in the living room um, because they're just not enough three and four bedroom units. So I would just like to um, raise this as an issue uh, and, um, and see if anybody on the board might be interested in possibly like forming a committee or uh, just maybe working on a resolution or just kind of looking into this issue uh, further. Okay, thank you very much, Corinne. Uh, I believe, uh, what? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Claire. Corinne, thanks. Um, lots of points of interest there. I, I grew up in a family of 12, um, two to a room, but we had a house. My husband grew up in housing, four kids, four boys in one bedroom, and the parents had the other room. I get it. Uh, after college, having three roommates and 350 square feet, that's, that gets a little old. That, that does not make sense. <laughs> okay. And when a developer tells me that they're building 53 micro units that are th one bedroom, 350 square feet, and a family could live here, as Paul Lamb said at the Kinao Street property, and a family can move in here. Once you go into that space and put furniture in it, you'll all have to stay standing up forever. Okay. Um, this micro unit thing is absurd. It's absolutely absurd. So I do agree with you that we need human size uh, apartments. And, you know, my sister raised her twin daughters. They got the bedroom. She slept on the sofa bed. I get it. Um, so I'd like to see more responsible construction that is for grown-ups and families and not these little micro unit little shelves you can pull out of the building, you know, the little chicken coops. It's it's inhumane. A prison cell is recommended 70 square feet. Giving 300 square feet for four people is is cruel in my opinion. So I'd be interested in pursuing it further. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Claire. Uh do we have He's raising any... his hand. Uh, oh, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. Also happy to help draft uh, any resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, okay, do we have any other resident and community concerns? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, I know Chuck said he didn't want, or we don't have to have the Makiki Lower Punchbowl Neighborhood Security Watch. Uh, but we have a little bit of time. Would you do you have anything to share or not at this time? My okay. my team's been pretty busy with other stuff, and I put my efforts into nice neighborhood. Yep. For now. Awesome. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, John, do you have anything on the Wahoo Metropolitan Planning Organization? Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have the uh, monthly newsletter. We brought a copy. Uh, this is an organization um, nationally funded basically by the Department of Transportation, okay? And they do long-term transportation studies. So they determine where railroads go, where buses can go, not go, that sort of thing. Um, and then they take federal money and they give it to people who want it. And so we've had this organization uh, actually, I was an employee for AMPO 50 years ago. Uh, but they, they are this group. And anyway, uh, they keep, keep asking people, what should we do next? And uh, right now, they're just kind of going back and forth. Uh, they're worried about gravel 
uh, along the South Shore. And um, yeah. anyway, so anyway, I brought up a copy to for the board to look at. And uh, but if you want to do anything long term in transportation, this is a place to go. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, is there any board response? Any board questions for John? Seeing none, is there anyone, any other residents have any questions for uh, regarding the Oahu Metropolitan Planning Organization? Seeing none, thank you very much. And uh, with that, we can kind of end early. <laughs> Announcements. Next regular meeting, the Makiki Lower Punchbowl Tantalus Neighborhood Board Number 10 is scheduled to meet on Thursday, October 17th, 2024 at 6 p.m. at Makiki District Park and online via WebEx. The meetings can be viewed on Olelo Focus 49 at 9 p.m. on the first Friday of the month and again on the first and third Sunday at 3 p.m. You can follow us at facebook.com slash Makiki NB. That's um, Makiki and the letters NB. Uh, and then for board member contact information, go to https colon slash slash www.honolulu.gov slash nco slash nb10. Oh, uh, go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Tom Heinrich speaking individually here. Uh, as announcements, I wanted to wrap up with a couple of things uh, of interest to the board. Uh, one of which has been um, uh, mentioned already, but let me just do it in chronological order. Uh, of interest for this area, because uh, I didn't hear it uh, otherwise earlier this evening, of course, this coming Monday, uh, September 23rd at 6 p.m. at Kawananakoa Middle School Cafeteria is the City Council public hearing on the primary urban center development plan. Okay. Uh, so the main focus, especially, is on Council District 6, uh, which is Tyler Dos Santos Tam. Uh, so again, that is this coming Monday, 6 to 7.30, I think, is the announced time. But it is a formal public hearing of the City Council, uh, and part of that is supposed to be a brief presentation on uh, the uh, proposed PUCDP uh, by the Department of Planning and Permitting. Uh, secondly, and as Representative Bellotti uh, mentioned earlier, on Tuesday, September 24th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. at Stevenson Middle School Cafeteria is the community meeting on Little Fire Ants. Uh, and I'm sure some other questions will come up, uh, but several uh, key statewide experts on Little Fire Ants and some of the other invasive issues uh, will be present uh, at Stevenson. And then finally, on Wednesday, September 25, no, I'm not going to be home next week, uh, the City Department of Transportation Services, part of the Complete Streets Program, uh, is doing a uh, presentation with a national speaker uh, at Neil Blaisdell Center, the Hawaii Suites area. Uh, I believe that starts at 5.30, uh, 5.30 to 7.30, uh, and that is uh, specifically focusing on the national, but especially Hawaii, pedestrian uh, safety crisis. Okay, uh, so again, activities in the community, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, uh, and all of them having significant connectivity uh, to this neighborhood board area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Tom. That's yeah, I put that all in my calendar. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, shall we have a motion to adjourn? Okay. Okay. We can go ahead and adjourn. Hold on, Mahalo, Chair. Thank you very much, Ian. <laughs>